thank you. So uh, welcome to the to the last panel of the of the day. Replay. We heard record, remaster, and now we're going to talk about replay. What do we do with the data? How do we interact with the data? How do we um, bring it back into the real world in, in some way. So our first speaker is Ian Bogost, um, who is the Ivan Allen College Distinguished Chair in Media Studies and Professor of Interactive Computing at Georgia Institute of Technology and founding partner at Persuasive Games, LLC. And you probably have read his column uh, on The Atlantic. I came across Ian's work uh, many years ago uh, when I picked up a book called Alien Phenomenology is I, you know, I think phenomenology is what sort of got us, got us together and um, just really blew my mind that one could think through, um, through phenomenology uh, into all sorts of different sort of realities. And he's followed up with a um, really an incredible book that is, um, that has brought the whole notion of gaming uh, to the broader public. Uh, called Play Anything, and this book takes the notion that, that playing, gaming, can be a way n not, as we mostly, most of us that have kids think about it, you know, put down your iPad, damn it, you, you know, engage with us, you know, uh, but we think of gaming as a way to sort of cut us off from the world, as something that is detaching us from the world. And Ian has really turned this on its head and, and really helped a lot of us to think about gaming as a way of engaging the world, of getting deeper into the world. And that is really quite an extraordinary um, sort of reversal in our relationship to technology. That yes, of course, it's a form of mediation, but it doesn't have to be an alienating form of mediation. It can actually be an engaging form of, me of mediation. And this book has had a tremendous success uh, in, 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 in the field and in the general public. And in some ways, um, the, the, this conference was in a way inspired by this book, the, the notion that technology can be a way of actually rethinking our, our discipline. So it's very exciting to have uh, Professor Ian Bogost here today. Please join me in welcoming him. I'm, I'm, so, I'm so grateful to be here. Thank you so much uh, for coming. Uh, so many, many years ago now, I was running an errand at this mall in Atlanta uh, where I live, and, and it was you know, crowded and awful like malls are, and all I wanted to do uh, was, was get out. Uh, but I had, I had my daughter with me, and she was about four years old, and so I was kind of like dragging her around the mall trying to finish my errands, and she clutched my hand, and I sort of steered her through the, the throngs of shoppers, and uh, she was having a really hard time uh, keeping up, and I was annoyed, and, and then finally I looked down, and I saw what was going on. She was staring like straight down at her feet, trying to time her footfalls so that they would, they would fall within the boundaries of the white, the square white tiles that lined uh, the mall floor. And the sensations that I'd interpreted as these tugs were just her trying to avoid uh, like violating the grout lines uh, as I pulled her uh, through the crowd. Now this is you know, nothing new in some ways, it's just a rediscovery of the, the step on a crack, break your mother's back, uh, Victorian superstition that eventually developed into a game uh, for sidewalks. Uh, but her, her version added something, too. It added something new. Because I was leading her by the hand, she didn't have to look where she was going. And that limitation actually created a new freedom. And it allowed her to focus on, on her feet instead of uh, the human obstacles. And this was like a, a completely vertiginous experience. It was challenging and pleasurable and delightful, um, much more so than the experience uh, I was having on my my dumb uh, trip to the mall. She, she had made the most of the situation, and I had completely uh, failed to do so. And uh, this was maybe a dozen years now. I've never stopped thinking about it. it it's, it's the opener of this, this book that Jorge mentioned. Um, and you know, on, on first blush, it might remind you, this sort of advice might remind you of, of one of the, maybe the best known uh, philosopher of games, uh, Mary Poppins, uh, who has this, uh, this spoonful of sugar uh, nonsense. Um, a spoonful of sugar makes the, helps the medicine go down, uh, she advises. But, but if you think about this, the problem is that uh, this theory, uh, it just doesn't make any sense, actually. You know, there's a robin that sings a song while making a nest, and a honeybee that enjoys a, a sip of nectar while buzzing from 
bud to bud. And we might just ask, you know, are, like, are, is this really what's going on with robins and, and bees? Uh, actually, worker bees store uh, their nectar in a, in a pouch. It's called a crop, and they regurgitate it back up when they get to the hive, which doesn't seem like a kind of prim Victorian activity uh, uh, to me at all. I I instead, what's happening with this is that um, this spoonful of sugar type advice, it presents play as something that covers over a drudgery, you know, it's like hiding the work in the in the in the song of nest building or the the the, the Poppins-ish song of, uh, of of cleanup, and this idea it's had a, a real impact, even if not uh, directly, even if not in a way that you think about. People really do assume that play amounts to how people overcome the circumstances that face them, rather than from those circumstances themselves. The, the circumstances that we encounter, those are assumed to be inert. They're only activated in our imaginations by, by our own human uh, ingenuity. But, but even like dumb, accidental experiences like this one, they, they show us that something else is going on, actually. Fun doesn't come from escaping something, but from uh, embracing it. And meaning and pleasure arises then when you allow things to be uh, exactly what they are, and when you participate actively in the process of, of using them, even when those things seem arbitrary or, or stupid or worthless, and, and perhaps especially uh, then. Uh, the philosopher Bernard Sweets called play the voluntary attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles. So play is something that's good enough on its own. It's, it's something for which that on its ownness uh, is exactly the point. And he had a name for this stance, the lucery attitude. And that, that attitude, that lucery attitude, applies to more than games, too. You know, we say that a mechanism, like a steering assembly, has has some play in it, a space through which uh, the wheel turns before the shaft uh, turns the pinion, or we talk about the play of light or the play of waves or a play on words. Uh, and, and two friends of mine, the, the game designers, Katie Salen and, and Eric Zimmerman, uh, have a take that a, a great take that accounts for all those sense, senses. They call play free movement within a more rigid structure. So play isn't uh, a process of extracting enjoyment, but one of manipulating the structure uh, of an object. Players don't, don't seek to overcome that structure, but to subject themselves uh, to it. And that means that play isn't a, isn't a free-for-all. It's not uh, doing whatever you want, as we sometimes think. Stop playing. Stop playing around. Don't play with your food. It's not the opposite uh, of work, either. It's, it's work of a different kind. It's like the, the work uh, of woodworking, you know, the work of working a system rather than the work of, of clocking in. And if you want, you can use terms that are more familiar to, to the design disciplines. Play as the, the encounter of limit, limitations and constraints, for example, in which something's structure opens a space of possible interactions for the people and things that might encounter it. And you can apply this to anything. I mean, think about a guitar, which is a thing, at least in English, that we say that we play. And when you play a guitar, you hold its fretted fingerboard in certain patterns while strumming its strings in others in order to produce sounds. Uh, you don't do whatever you want with the guitar. Uh, and you certainly don't sing a song about how miserable it is uh, to use one. So that makes play a property of, of material things. It's not a thing that people do to escape those things. It's rather a name for what happens when you exercise their capacities. Uh, and that further means that play applies to anything whatsoever, not just to toys or to games, you know, to transmissions or yarn or language or gardens or dishwashers or relationships or buildings for that matter. Uh, and to understand the implications, we have to be willing to pay serious attention to anything uh, whatsoever. And that's a philosophical project as much uh, as a designerly one. And, and here's where we enter this domain of alien phenomenology and so forth. So I've been running with this group of philosophers who em embrace the idea uh, that anything is worthy of attention. Uh, and uh, uh, we've been calling ourselves uh, object-oriented ontology, or sometimes triple O, which I apologize for, but these are just names. You can ignore them. And uh, one of the contrarian takes of this triple O position is that uh, existence is the same for anything that exists, uh, which we sometimes call flat ontology, which is a, a term just brazenly stolen from Manuel de Landa. And one way that I've put this is like this. Everything equally exists, but not everything exists equally. And another uh, position, another philosophical position central to this theory is uh, a kind of opposition to relationism, the, the position that associations between entities are more real than the entities uh, themselves, and you know, the privileging of flows and becoming and change and flux. Uh, and, and as you probably know, these philosophies of relation have been popular in architecture for, for many years, mostly adopted as sort of firm, formal interpretations 
uh, of, of the philosophical traditions rather than as attempts to implement those traditions. Uh, you know, so we have something like parametricism, which is a relationist response to postmodernism, is probably the, the, among the most influential. And like most relationisms, this position thinks that it's on the right side of history, of course, because complexity and dynamism are the way of the world in the post-Fordist global knowledge economy, and someone like uh, Patrick Schumacher has been you know, a theoretical proponent uh, of this idea, but its, it's influence has also spread through the tools uh, that we use, things like Grasshopper that use visual programming to do design by coupling changes in, in, in inputs and outputs. Uh, and you know, this, this theory is kind of maybe a little bit on the wane, like even though Schumacher is, has himself warned against using it as a kind of mass, so-called master discourse, uh, he's also gotten into, into trouble, especially lately, about you know, starting to look like a totalitarianist on positions of the, uh, of the built environment, which is maybe suggesting some openings uh, to new positions. Um, and now, like, I am not uh, an architect or, or a planner or, or a preservationist, really, at least not in, in, a, in a trained sense. I'm really a scholar and critic of, of media and technology. But, but just by weird happenstance, I, I collided with architecture and urban design through an accidental uh, descent into land use politics uh, in Atlanta, where I live. And, and I do a lot of work in local historic preservation. And one thing that I noticed uh, when I started doing this work is how useful it, it turned out to be to adopt uh, this playful methodology um, as an approach uh, uh, to preservation design. And another thing uh, that I learned, which I'm somewhat anxious about talking about in this room, is how, how ordinary and mundane uh, the objects of play in that context become. You know, the, the work that all of you do is, is just uh, remarkable and completely ex inspiring. But, but on average, uh, in practice, uh, it seems to me that historic preservation is less often a practice of, of documenting and restoring and preserving monuments and landmarks, and more often one of you know, managing the pedantic details of design and influence in, in specific protected contexts, of which there are, there are hundreds and hundreds of these. And even like the most basic of, the, of, these, uh, of these design elements, these things that we don't even think about anymore, uh, end up being profoundly at play. So like, just take like the most boring example you can think of, which is something like setback, uh, which might seem completely straightforward. Like how do you match the average setback in an area of influence? It's just like a calculation. You, could, you, could, you, could, you don't even need a computer to do it. Uh, but you know, even establishing that notion, that area of influence, the region that's going to be visually impacted by a change, uh, isn't so easy. It's about what's visible from where and when, during what time of year, and all sorts of factors that uh, that are difficult to automate come into play, and, and it makes these like plan style summaries uh, of the idea uh, insufficient. They only make sense in specific. Uh, circumstances, or you know, like establishing the rhythm of, of perceived massing is sometimes difficult because it's a function of on-the-ground perception, not, not measured information. And I think it shows where the attention to entanglements of particular entities at play uh, is essential, and also why it's difficult, especially in context. So I want to show you an example uh, from a, a special character area within the, the district that, where, where I work most. Um, which is even more squirrely because it's subject to these kind of random bad guidelines that are different from the ones that are normally handed down by the, by the Secretary of the Interior. And I, I'm, I'm actually purposely picking an example that is the most edge case possible. It's this sort of hanger on to a, a truly historic Frederick Law Olmsted designed uh, uh, neighborhood. Uh, and I don't have time to go through this in detail, but here's a little bit of context. That we have this thing that's called a recommendation, which is actually a it's, a, it's kind of a non-guideline. It has juridical implications that are much softer than, than those of a, a traditional guideline or a law or zoning or what have you. Uh, but what it calls for here, you don't have to read it, is uh, minimization of, of perceived scale for infill, consistency in height of new construction, no more than two floors from the primary street frontage, and, and acknowledges a number of implications of, of, of hilly topography. That's, that's sort of the summary of this. So there was this plat, it's, it looks like this, uh, that was targeted for, for redevelopment in this district. And, and it's surrounded by mostly these one and one and a half story pre and post war um, ranch and minimal traditional homes. Um, and like, this is just a completely different context than everything we've heard uh, thus far today. Uh, but the issues arise uh, really quickly. Like, like this, you can see there's two, this is a corner lot. What does a, a recommendation about primary frontage imply about secondary frontage? Or what is a two story home for that matter? And how should it be? You know, interpreted in relation to its neighbors. So this is a horrific, horrific design that got floated uh, for this lot, this sort of ghastly, engorged, faux prairie spec design kind of thing that's, that seems to be replacing engorged faux craftsman spec homes in, in residential construction these days. And, and I've picked it partly because it is, it, is, it is so horrifying in some ways. Like, this is not the Parthenon. But these are the kinds of structures 
uh, that actually get, get built every day uh, in the world. And this particular one was rejected, thank God, uh, not because it's ghastly, but because it appeared to have three full stories on the secondary street frontage. And you know, when I look at it, I kind of think, okay, yeah, like that, that seems right, but like, why is it? is it? Is it the hip gabled outcropping there on the, on the left? Is it the, the narrow casement windows above the, the, the double hungs uh, in the center? Is it, is it just the overall impression of height created by exposing the garage uh, via these retaining walls? And then there were other things like the height and the rhythm and topography uh, of, the, of the street that introduced different elements. So you look at the street, streetscape view, this is a different design. Uh, and you kind of think, okay, well, like, you know, that, that might look okay. Like maybe you could bring the ridge down a foot or something. Uh, but if this is the only evidence you have, then it's less credible. Actually, the street goes uphill, and there's this, this, this rhythm of, uh, of one and a half story uh, mass and void. Uh, and so if you start to ask questions like, well, does the hypothetical uh, front elevation at left violate that pattern, then why w would it do so? You know, is it, what is the nature of the problem, especially given that we've been told that two-story homes are okay? Is it, is it the, the 12 and 12 slope with the shed dormer? Or is that a half story or a full story? Like, you know, these days architects seem to think that any upper floor with, without full height ceilings is a one and a half story structure? Like, is that the case or not or why? And if you imagine trying to like account for those, for those uh, questions parametrically, let's say, then I, I guess you could. You could imagine some, some madman designing systems like we've heard about today for blocks like this where they would, you know, be able to adjust like height, height or plate height or something that would dial in a solution for the street. But, but of course, that's a nonsensical idea, really. You, you can't alter the environment in that way. I mean, you probably are not going to fly drones to do 3D scanners for later perceived massing analysis. Uh, you probably won't run like some sort of machine learning algorithm to automate the process of doing so. Uh, and even if you did, would you have enough data to build a model that would be credible? Like this is, this is not Venice. This is the opposite uh, of Venice. Uh, and, and on top of it all, you know, the whole issue is still implicated in, in the local legal um, interpretation of this notion of a recommendation. This is just like a complete and utter mess. And it's just a simple, stupid residential home. So there's still, to me, this kind of dream of this like, friction-free solution to problems like this, where, where you know, we, just, we just throw enough technological tools at the, at, the, at the situation, and the answers will become clearer. Like, you know, we, we get enough you know, shadow modeling and mass modeling and zoning compliance tools, uh, like you know, geodesign kind of approaches, and they would point the way to solutions. But then you look at even monumental structures, and they run into similar kinds of problems. You remember when the, the Gary Disney Concert Hall had to be buffed down because it was blinding nearby residents? Or you may or may not know about this. This is the, the museum tower in downtown Dallas that was literally melting sculptures at the Nasher uh, next door. <laughs> So there's not, there's not just play in, in individual elements, uh, like between the fingers and the guitar, between you know, light and shadow, but even in this like, meta-designerly question of what elements are relevant and possible to consider in a particular context, and the possibility space of most design projects, like even rebuilding a, a modest uh, single-family home is just, it's so enormous and so grotesquely tangled uh, that it always hides some secrets, and it's, it's up to us to sort of tease them out, to be willing to look for them. Um, and, you know, in the, in, the, in the example I showed you in, in, my, in my neighborhood, the ultimate object of design isn't even really the house, is it? it it's the overall streetscape environment uh, of the area of influence, which is a thing that we almost can't design, at least not directly. So it's kind of no wonder that it would be easier uh, to, to adopt some sort of totalitarian position on design. It would be a, a much easier answer. And another easy answer is to just focus preservation efforts on, on you know, stuff that deserves it, on, on real landmarks, the ones that are worthy of, of the time, attention, and investment of, of advanced uh, technologies. But, you know, if we return to the, to the mall floor and the guitar and Sweet's losery attitude, I, I, they offer to me reminders to us that all design and all use involves the same kind of play, respecting the play at work in, in any particular circumstance. And that can help us activate every object, every single one, as worthy of design's uh, attention. So instead of seeing play as activities, if instead you conceive of it as, as conditions that are brought about when people engage seriously and deliberately with specific objects in specific circumstances, then you're getting somewhere. And you can think of design the same way too. Really, design and play to me are the same. But the problem is we, we kind of look down our noses at many of these things and many of these circumstances. Like, people just don't care about an ordinary streetscape like they care about an exceptional landmark. 
Uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm like a little embarrassed to show you these examples even in, in, in this context today. You know, like what's, what's the point really? Uh, a shopping mall floor or a, or a faux prairie residential home, are, are, they're considered jokes, things to ignore or things to disdain. And, and you might reasonably ask, like, what kind of, of crazy person would care about ceramic tile or the rhythm and massing, rhythm of massing and void on this dubiously significant uh, post-war street? But it just strikes me that you could point that sneer at anything, at anything whatsoever. Whereas instead, our, our world is, is just filled, it's jam-packed with splendor and mystery, most of which we never notice because we, we only dream of mastering bigger and supposedly more important things with, with ever greater leverage. And technology is only fueling that capacity. So play offers an invitation to, to pay attention to anything at all in the hopes of, of like bringing out that thing's unique use and value and, and meaning. Uh, and play or, or design, if you want, isn't about you, really. It's not about your own pleasure or cleverness or, or achievement. It's about what you manage to do with the things that you find. So this, this philosophical idea, this flat ontological principle, uh, isn't just uh, me blowing hot air. It allows or invites a different perspective on the built environment as discrete instead of continuous, and, and thereby it allows play to become uh, I think a, a design strategy to help identify specific elements that we could work on. It's not just a metaphor. Uh, Tom Wiscombe has been arguing, uh, for example, that coherence in design doesn't come from literal continuity anyway, but by understanding the built environment as, as objects wrapped in objects wrapped in objects, or this is his quip for it, discrete things acting upon one another. Uh, you know, and so far this, this triple O influence on, on architecture in particular, I don't think it's really hit planning or, or, or preservation, uh, uh, but the architects love a new philosophy, of course. Uh, and it's led mostly to pr provocations. You know, Mark Foster Gage has this bonkers uh, Neolithic, Neo-Gothic skyscraper, which gives the sort of like the finger to all the Delisian folds that we're used to and just encrusts the whole fucking building with stuff. And, and you know, and then Wiscombe has these, uh, these uh, studies of form, the ways that the ground and mass can be made distinct from one another. And, and those are interesting, you know, provocations to me. But, but I wonder what other interpretations um, might be possible uh, of, of this philosophical approach, you know, that might invite us to see design in a way that makes it a process of focusing deep curiosity and care on specific objects in specific circumstances, rather than a process of, of realizing a, a pre-established uh, vision that assumes that there is ultimate uh, independence and ultimately resonant value and meaning in everything whatsoever. Thank you very much. Anyone that has uh, done a preservation project connected with, uh, with, with, with the, really the importance of the vernacular that you're, you're pointing at. So thank you for, for that. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of questions, um, but we'll have to wait uh, till the end for those. Uh, and our next speaker is Arno Barnhoff, uh, producer for virtual and augmented reality content experiences, um, and who throughout his career has delivered uh, content for brands and agencies across many aspects of production. Uh, is uh, somebody that has worked on uh, uh, enhanced virtual reality. And I became really interested in his work when I heard about a project where they had gone in uh, to the Amazon and tried to um, understand intangible heritage, to begin to uh, document intangible heritage uh, through these new technologies and to get the whole realm of experience and so get beyond the uh, optical, um, um, let's say, uh, paradigm that we were talking about this morning. And what is amazing about his work is his emphasis on playing back this information in a meaningful way that allows users from all backgrounds to engage with it. Um, so please join me in welcoming our Nova. Well, thank you, first of all, for um, inviting me here. It's been a real pleasure listening to everyone talk. And it's been so fascinating to see how relevant everyone's topics are. And especially to what I'm going to be talking about is extremely different, because I'm taking uh, the approach to how to talk about preservation, but on a different level. Um, uh, so actually, so what I want to say first is something that just came to my mind is a few of the last talks I've been doing have been in VR and not in real life. 
So suddenly now I'm feeling that this is actually quite different doing a talk in real life. I had done them before, but I've done the last ones in, in virtual reality. I'm not saying that it's different because people are not like glitching out of the room and, and going through the floor, like it was a bit weird. And, and people don't enter through the door, they literally disappear here. It's quite, it's quite freaky. Um, but that's so, but it's more the, the, the sense of what I'm gonna talk about. And I think it's quite relevant to that feeling that I'm having between uh, doing a talk in virtual reality and doing a talk in real life is the sense of emotion and the sense of connection with you and the sense of empathy and all those senses of emotions that we have that I, can only, that I have in real life and not with avatars. And that's something um, I want to talk about, um, which is virtual reality being an em 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 empathy machine. And um, this is a term that's been used quite a lot for virtual reality. It's been a term that's been used uh, for, a, for a fair amount of time uh, comparing virtual reality to, a, to an empathy machine. And um, for those of you who have tried virtual reality or experiences that have really connected to you, you'll understand that, um, why, why it's called that, because it really can make you feel it. So um, first of all, I think just, um, I'm sure that just by reading this, you might all have these, these, these words or sentences or things that you might, um, that you think are connecting now virtual reality and empathy. I'm going to put a few words on here that, that I have, um, that people have told me for watching experiences that, that I've produced or things that, that I think are relevant to us. Um, and uh, there's a lot more of them, and I thought I'd just put some of these and then, and then use this as a guide for just defining a bit of what I want to talk about around emotion and empathy within um, experiences. So the first one is creating and using empathy or, um, and giving a great understanding of the world. Here's an experience that they did inside the human, inside the human heart to give uh, um, an understanding of what happens inside your heart, and it wasn't, a, it wasn't an animation, it was a simulation, so you created the actual architecture of the heart, and then put blood flow into it and let it do its thing. So it wasn't pre-animated. It was really just making it. So you were in there and experiencing what it was like to see the inside uh, of how the actual heart works. And that gives you, again, an understanding and a connection with it. Here's an experience around um, seeing life through the eyes of, of, of bees, or it could be anything, insects, animals. And that's also creating a connection, a great understanding of how something else, it could be an object, it could be an animal, an insect, another person, how those, how those things connect to you and how they could be relevant to you and to understand what it's like to be something else or to be connected with something else. Um, here's another one um, we did uh, around uh, a descent. Well, actually, one of the, one of the, the, um, the uh, most dangerous trips known to man, which is descending from the ISS down to Earth. And uh, this was also uh, to give you a more uh, a personal experience. This is how you, you could feel to be someone else and experience their trip, a, a very specific thing that has happened, and the experience in your own way and understanding, oh, what would I have done or how, how would I feel if I was doing that other thing that someone else did? And that's something you get to do in virtual reality. Um, and then another, another section is also time travel. I was really happy that um, Frederick spoke about uh, time travel because it makes, makes me a le little less insane talking about time travel. But to um, uh, be honest, I think I I've always, and I'm, I'm sure like a lot of other people, when I was a kid I used to dream a lot about time traveling. It was in cartoons and movies. It's something that I thought was this impossible but really cool thing. And now since I've been doing virtuality for, you know, since probably 2013 now, producing virtuality content, I see time travel as just a different thing now. It's, it's something that I can do. If it's tangible and I can touch it, I can smell it and I can see it and I can hear it, it's almost as close to time travel as we'll get, and we'll just get better at doing that. And, and, and then some, you know, we'll see it as, as change in the future by understanding more the past or, or the present. So what I want to do is talk about um, a very specific project um, that Jorge just sort of uh, mentioned early on, which was um, uh, in the Amazon forest. And, and, I, and the reason I want to choose it because it encompasses all these ideas I just mentioned, rather than just one of them. And, um, this case study is, um, is, is uh, around a tribe called the Mundaruku, who are Mundaruku, a, a tribe in the Amazon forest. And they were going to... Um, well, it's, it's the Brazilian government, basically, was going to build a, a series of mega dams around the territory of the Mundaruku tribe. And the territory is roughly the size of Paris, Amsterdam, and London, all put together. So it's a very big territory. And the, the dams would have flooded the entire area. And so we collaborated, uh, collaborated with Greenpeace and a company called The Feelies to, to uh, create an experience that would connect you with the tribe, that would connect with them because we wanted to make a difference. We wanted to drive action for, um, for, um, for, the, for this tribe and what was happening. So 
Um, again, I'm going to put through some words again here to show what a thought process could be on how we're going to make those emotional connections and make that, why we would make that connection and how we think about it. So first one is, so you would start with that, flooding of the Mandaruku tribe territory. That's the basis of it. The second one is, how do you create a connection with the Mandaruku? Because we've got to create a connection with them. It can't just be you're there and that's it. You know, you've got to have some sort of connection. Otherwise, you're just going to take off the headset. You're going to look away. You're not going to find it relevant to you. Um, and another one is, you know, why, why should everyone care? And again, these are just thoughts that might just come to you just suddenly when you're trying to figure something out. These are just um, thoughts like that. Why, you know, why should everyone care? How to make everyone care? Is it too far away to affect us? And how, clo and how to close that distance? And these are some, amongst a lot of other things, I find these ones quite important because these are the ones that, that create that emotional connection and create why we would feel connected and why we'd want to drive action or make differences. So what we did is we went over to the Amazon forest, spent two weeks over there with, with some uh, specialist VR equipment, special audio equipment, um, as you would do for those type of productions. And we filmed the way they live. They dance, they eat, they cook, um, and they hunt. And we filmed those events without scripting it, just to see how, how so you could experience what it's like to be part of their tribe. Now, so this is me explaining a very a very, a very simple concept of, of VR production, or, or film production for that matter, which is very familiar to, to, to a lot of us. But what we did in this one, which was very different, was we recorded more than just um, the visual or the audio. We recorded um, the heat levels and the humidity and the smell so that we could capture what it's like to be present in that moment, to be present in that environment, Emotionally, uh, because, uh, and I can give you actually, and I, again, I thought about this when I was walking around in, in, um, in New York um, yesterday. Uh, I, I had this moment where I was, I was walking down the street and I thought, wow, uh, I, I'd, I'd love, I'm send, I want to send something. I wasn't, at that moment, I wasn't sure what it was to, to, to someone. And I was like, oh, I, uh, this is, this is, I really like this moment. I'm going to send this. I take up my phone like most people and I'm, like, oh, and I'm like, wait a minute. What is this moment that, I, that I'm trying to send? Is it actually a picture? Because this is just a reflex. I'm pulling out my phone. But actually, the, what I wanted to send was the moment. And I realized I couldn't do that because we don't have, I couldn't send the, I realized it was the smell and then the, the heat and the wind and, then, and everything. And I, and I thought, oh, actually, I can't send that. So I didn't send anything because I thought a picture didn't encompass that feeling that I had at that moment. It was more, it was much more than just that photo. So therefore, just sending that picture to someone would just not mean anything to them. It would mean 10% of maybe what I felt at that moment. So this is kind of what, what we, were, we were capturing, was much more than just the image. We were capturing all the things that make a moment emotional for us and drive that empathy um, towards, towards other people. So uh, we had a classically trained perfumer on with us um, amongst uh, our, our professional crew um, who uh, captured the scents. Uh, the way he did that was, uh, amongst other things, was write poems about them. So he would smell them and he would write a poem. He was there with his thing and he would write it. And it was fascinating because it, you think that, um, that you wonder how, how that comes about. How do you recreate smells? And there's obviously a variety of ways of learning and I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a professional in, in recreating scents. Um, and, um, but the way that was his technique for doing it and, and we created six dis uh, distinguished scents for the, for the experience. Um, and some for inside the village, some for inside the forest, some for them where they were cooking. You've got these scenes where you have, um, you're having breakfast with the Mondaruku tribe and they grind their own coffee. And you can, you, while you're watching it, you can actually smell their coffee while you're in the experience. So you can really smell, you can smell what they're cooking and what they're giving to you. And, and suddenly that connection is, is extremely powerful. Um, and what I want to talk about is, is that the, the sense we went into the project was that these are people just like us. And before that moment, it was more that they were going to just get flooded their territory. And if no one did anything about it, um, and we didn't create those connections with Greenpeace and the Feelies to create a project that would drive empathy, um, we, you know, it's, it, there wouldn't have been an understanding that there are, these, are just, these are people just living lives like we do. Um, and I find that this is quite an important one here, that temporary empathy... Um, wouldn't change a thing. And I think that's quite important when we were planning it, is that we weren't looking to create something that's just temporary, where you're going to be in there and just feel that, oh, I watched the Mandaruku tribe live. That's not what we wanted. We didn't want people to feel that they just watched a tribe live or just watched 
people danced or watched people have breakfast. We wanted to feel that you were with them, living with them, or having breakfast with them, and dancing with them. That's the purpose of it, because then you feel connected with them, and you feel, you feel um, a, a, a bond, and then that drives action. And when you finish the experience, you still have that empathy. It's not temporary. You bring it with you, and then you talk to other people about it. And that subconsciously, the way you talk about it with other people will be um, on a level like you, that you did live with them, and not that you just saw a movie about the Mundaruku tribe, which is very different. You live an experience or you watch a movie about an experience. The way you talk about that experience, even if they're the same, um, will be very different, because you lived it. Um, and that's what we were trying to do with this. Um, and uh, what we thought was it's, it's um, not saying here again that, that empathy without meaning is just entertainment, that it's not good to use empathy for entertainment. I'm talking for the purpose of this experience. It's not what we are looking for. Um, there is entertainment embedded with it, but it's not, it's not the core part of the project. And if there is no meaning behind the empathy that you can do, because we can drive, I can drive empathy in a, in a film uh, uh, without, without it having any meaning, as in real life meaning. Um, that, that's not, it's not complicated. We, you can get script writers, you can get directors, you can do that. That's what movies do, they drive empathy, but usually it's quite temporary. Um, and so what we're trying to do here is understand how they live and how they do things and how, how they how they go about their life so that we can create that non-temporary experience. And that is very, very important for, um, it, it's almost like now that we've said preservation a lot, and that's normal over the course of these uh, talks, it's almost like preservation of the senses, preservation of that space of, for example, their tribe, their forest, their village, preservation of the smells and of the heat and the humidity, because that's what makes them be who they are there and how they feel there. And you couldn't feel how you do feel there without those elements. If it was ice cold, it would be very different than if it's hot. But if you can't feel those, you can't feel the temperature, then you can't really feel how you would feel over there. It's not possible. So that's, uh, it, that's part of the things that we, th that we thought were, were very important in, in terms of, and at the time, I think we never really saw it as preservation. I think it's more over the course of doing several projects and doing them that we realized um, that it, is, it actually is very close to that. It's archiving senses. It's archiving um, a, an, emotional, um, an emotional spectrum for, for an actual um, space in, uh, in the world. And I think that, um, that I'll, uh, I'm actually going to, uh, I'll, I'll talk about actually how I think that connects with the other, with the other projects after in, 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 in a second section. Um, these, are the, these are the pods that we used for, for the experience. So they were, um, they were, uh, a pods for a single person to come in and they would sit down and you would put on a virtual ID headset and then there you would feel heat, humidity, um, you would feel wind, you would serve scent. So it would really just trigger all your senses and throughout the experience you would be, um, uh, all those would be triggered. And as we got all the different, it wasn't just we just got humidity in general over it. We got, we got the different um, uh, humidities and sounds and smells of all the different areas and all the different positions that we placed the viewer in. So those changed throughout the experience. So you really felt that you were going through an entire spectrum of their village and their forest and their hunting and their dancing and their cooking and all of that. And you got to experience the whole range. And what we had was that um, a lot of people would come out, um, a, a, fair, a, a huge amount of people would come out very emotional. Not, they went in with the notion that, that what was happening to them so you already, had, you already had this notion before that they were going to get flooded. You already knew that. You, you knew it's going to happen. And you go in there thinking, OK, there's these people that I don't know. I don't know them. I just know the name now. I'm Underuku. And I'm going to go in here and try this experience. And then suddenly during the experience, you know these people. You know them. And then you know the problem that's happening. So people would come out crying. They would come out extremely emotional. Um, and they would, not, uh, they would not understand after when you said, oh, the, they're going to get flooded. And the whole territory is going to disappear. And it's massive territory. It's bigger than, you know, as I said, it's London, Paris, Amsterdam, all put together. It's a massive land for a lot of people. Um, and that was the difference. Initially, they weren't suddenly crying when you told them the Mandaruku tribe were going to be flooded. There's a, no one cried when you said that before the experience. It's just, I, it, it, it almost doesn't, wouldn't make much sense. They might feel a bit like, oh, it's not very nice. Or you know, they, well, they wouldn't feel really, really emotional about it. But they would when they come out of the experience. And that proves that. Um, uh, and for those of you who are wondering, um, it, the, the, the dams did not get built. So not saying that this is the, the driving factor of that, because Greenpeace had a, a big initiative to stop that. But we like to think that that had a big pass in it, because it did tour, it did go to a lot of places. 
and it did drive a huge amount of empathy um, and the connection and a sense of, of, of them belonging with us and us belonging with them, that sort of human connection that, that I think virtual reality is really um, good at doing, really good at, at, at creating those links when you can, when you can do them well. Um, and uh, not to say that just doing a film on its own without all the senses doesn't create that, but as I said, it, it tends to be, and I've done a lot of those, again, before multisensory, uh, it, it tends to be quite temporary. And it tends to be quite, that some, it's more of a subconscious level. It's more of a, you don't talk about it the same way, as I said. It's not, it's not, a, it's not saying it doesn't work. It just, you won't, it, it's about how you talk about it after with other people. And when, you, when they come out of here and they're emotional and they're crying and they talk to you about it and you tell them what's happening and you talk more about it and they want to suddenly know more about it and they want to know how they can do a difference and make, and make a difference for, for what, you, what you've just told them before the experience. And, and then they suddenly want to take part in it and understand and know about Greenpeace, know about the feelings, know about the project, what else are we doing and who else are we saving. You know, and it's just, it becomes a whole thing because they feel that they're part of it now. It's too late. They've lived with them. You're, you're one of the tribesmen. <laughs> it's just you're, you're, you can't get away from it anymore. Um, and it, again, you could feel that this could be a... You, obviously, people can use this as, as a trap, in a sense. We don't have to use it for good. You can use it for bad, like most things. You, know, you can control people's emotions to take things from them. But I'm saying that, that um, if used carefully and used in, 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 in this way, for example, um, there are very, very good things that can come out of it. And uh, uh, I think um, I would like to talk about uh, very briefly, and I think this is um, uh, quite quite important. And I th um, uh, what, what's, what I think is going to come next, and I think that that's why I, I said at the beginning that I really enjoyed everyone else's talks before, and I'm actually quite happy that I was after everyone now because it, it creates that that link um, because then they would have created the link, and I prefer it's me this way now. So um, the the uh, when we're talking about uh, conservation of, of sites or conservation of, of uh, audio or, or also other, other, other things, combining all those together is how I feel that there is uh, what's next. I feel like this wouldn't be a presentation without talking about Eve. So um, this, <laughs> this, I feel like, yeah, someone might have not done it. He didn't get the memo, but everyone else has spoken about Eve. So um, th this is actually, yeah, the, the uh, Tom de, de um, and... Uh, this, just as an example, uh, there's a lot of other different sites. I so happen to have picked this one um, because Econom was talking early on. And um, let's just say you, 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 you've got this site now, and, and you, you've, you've, we've, this, is a, this is a concept. This is a preservation. This is re recreation of a of a, a real um, um, of a real, you know, a real real life um, um, place, a temple. And and then if you could actually conserve and recreate the sense and the heat and the humidity and the winds at a certain period of time, then you'll be able to go there and visit it and actually feel what it would be like to be there at a specific point of time, emotionally, not just there, uh, you know, just there visually. Uh, again, I think always talking about what it's like to watch the temple, but more like what it's like to actually be there in the temple, which is very different, because I could put you by that door right now. You wouldn't feel like you're actually there. You'd feel like you're watching it. And after, you'd have a memory of just watching it, but not actually being there and living. Um, there. Um, so this is currently where the stage we're at now. You go there, you can visit it, and walk around it. Um, and I think combining these amazing technologies with things that are um, recreating, um, uh, recreating the senses and recreating um, the sense of smell and touch and heat uh, are really important. And I thought what was fascinating is that we, we visited um, the audio um, Europe uh, yesterday. Um, um, and there are, there are team guys in, in, in New York who do uh, recreation of... Um, of uh, it's the almost like the resonant frequencies of rooms. So how how you can how you can um, uh, it was briefly spoken about early on actually how you can recreate um, what a sound would sound like in any space. So you could pick a space and re replay an audio and that's uh, uh, digitally an audio and it could make it sound like it's in any space that you have recorded. Um, and I feel that they're using those technologies as well combined with these technologies, we could recreate a digital version of pretty much the entire planet emotionally and also um, um, digitally of actual assets. Uh, and I almost feel that that's what's going to happen very soon. And that's kind of what Google is working on very hard as well, is, is creating almost like a digital backup of the planet. And not to say that that means you spill your coffee in the morning and, oh, you can just get that back from the backup. It's, it's, not, it's not that. It's, it, even though that would be really cool, and I'd, I'd, I'd really like that, because it happens quite often. I'd, I, would, I, would, I, I, it's, I think it's more, um, it's more uh, 
a backup in the sense that we can go through any point in time and visit it and learn about it, and that introducts how we're going to do things in the future or how we're going to design something in the future by understanding better the past. And, as, and I'm putting the emphasis on what my talk is about is, is understanding the emotion values and the empathy of that moment is how it's going to teach us more about the present and, and the past and how what we can do for it. Um, and I think recording those is quite important. So here's just a shot um, of what the interior would look like. And just to say this is kind of where we're at now on how you do it. You sit down, you've got the heat sensors and the wind sensors and all those things, and, and, you can, and this is how you experience it. And I think that moving forwards now in the next five, ten years, we will have a, a lot better systems where you'll have either the full haptic suits or we'll do it through other, other ways like ultrasounds or things like that which you don't need to wear anymore and to feel all those things or, or plug straight into um, you know, with neurosensors and, and, and such and uh, to be able to experience uh, going back to the time travel to experience or, or teleportation to, to experience other places emotionally and, and, and get value from, from those uh, uh, that, that more emotional connection and value from, from places which will drive us to take action again in the, in the, in the context of charity um, to drive action within, within those and to make a difference um, because we feel emotionally connected to those. And I feel that's very important um, in virtuality. And again, a very important for preservation because making people care about those areas and feel that they belong there as much as it belongs with us um, emotionally is, is very important. So it's not temporary. You don't show them a, a 3D asset and they're like, wow, I love that. And then walk away and they just completely forgot about it. It's more just like, wow, I love that. And I, I was there. That was me in the temple walking around and I feel like I lived in there. And then you've created now that link and it's forever with that person. It's a virtual memory for that person now. Uh, and then they will take action and then they will talk to about it with their children and they talk to it and they will become a, a way of life where we have visited the past and we have lived in the past emotionally um, as well as in the present and as well as designing our future emotionally. And I think that's quite important to use virtual reality for those things. Um, yeah, yeah, so that's, I Thank think. You. Our next speaker is Carlos Benaim. Um, and we are, I'm, I'm just so thrilled that Carlos is here. So thrilled. Um, because uh, he really is a legend of perfumery. Um, and um, those of you that know me know that I am obsessed with smell. And that you know, the, the preservation uh, of smell and the use of smell in preservation. And I met, uh, I was fortunate to meet Carlos um, somehow, I don't know, I think it was a conference, sort of like this, and then we just um, struck a friendship, which, I, um, which is really dear to me. Um, and I've just been able to be, uh, uh, to witness the, the art of perfumery through him and through his eyes. And uh, his work is really at the intersection of science and art. And this is, you know, we have been talking a lot about technology, but I think in everyone's talk, there has been an element of art. And when we talk about the kinds of legitimate disciplines that are allowed to be in preservation, certainly there are architects, there are planners, there are historians, uh, there are, um, you know, legal experts and so on. And we seldom talk about artists. And artists are a really important component of, of preservation and, um, and help us see and make different kinds of connections. And Carlos is one of those artists um, and also one of those scientists. Uh, so he's one of the lead perfumers for international flavors and fragrances. Um, and if you've ever bought a perfume, he probably designed it. Um, if you, wait to smell that until he tells you to smell it. You gotta, it's, you're getting a little ahead of yourself here. Uh, right, Carlos? They need to wait. Um, so I'll make it short and just to say, if you started to smell, you've already started to experience the work, Carlos, but You've already experienced it for many, many years if you've ever picked up a perfume bottle. He was either the designer or helped that designer make it what it was. So thank you, Carlos, for joining us. And please uh, join me in welcoming <laughs> Carlos. Thank you, thank you, Jorge. That's a very generous introduction. I'm going to get a bottle of water. And so the first thing I'm going to do is to 
awaken a little bit your sense of smell. And for those of you who have never used those strange strips that were given to you, they are called blotters. You basically hold it by the thick end and you smell the triangular end where, which is dipped in the substance. So, and don't put it inside your nose, just next to your nose <laughs> is enough. <laughs> so, so thank you, Jorge, for this wonderful invitation. I really enjoyed it. Memories have been a major inspiration for my work. And today, I want to convey some of my personal memories of the sense of the Morocco of my youth and my attempts to reproduce and interpret them. And I will give you also a glimpse of my creative process. And then I'll move to collective memories and to a description of an experiment we did at the Morgan Library. And I will conclude with my perspective about reinventing the past. The unique interaction between scent, taste, and memory constitutes my inner life when it, when it comes to smell. I know you can smell the blotter. As part of my early training as a perfumer, I had to identify fragrance ingredients with my eyes closed. One in particular smelled like blood in an incomprehensible way. It had none of the elements people typically associate with blood. And yet, not only I was seeing red, but the sensation also brought up an easy association to violence. And what was that? Years later, I put the pieces together. Accompanying my mother to the butcher as a child, I was horrified by the bloody carcasses hanging from the ceiling. The most striking aroma was that of the Moroccan cedarwood chips covering the floor. Scent, memory, response, all connected. The sense and taste of my youth in Tangier were marked by the rhythm of the season and the religious celebrations. In the summer, the odors would reach their maximal expression. All my senses were engaged when taking a walk in the Soko, the old Arab town. I remember seeing the Berber peasant woman coming from the Reef Mountains dressed in the colorful folkloric attire, they exuded a rancid odor of butter, of azuda, and of leather. They sat with their legs cl cl crossed, peeling prickly pears with their naked hands and offering the juicy fruits to us. And the animal and fecal smells of the mules and donkeys walking nonchalantly in the alleyways were so familiar that we hardly paid attention to them. And every Friday, the muezzin's uh, call to prayer in the alleys, uh, in the call to prayer, merged in memory with the butyric smell of hundreds of shoes left at the entrance of the mosques before prayer. In the alleys of the old town, lamb macerated in cumin, paprika, pepper, and curcuma was grilled in wood-burning fires. The blinding and perfume smoke would envelop the whole street, making you tear, uh, tear and salivate at the same time. The water seller, dressed in a bizarre costume typical of his profession, wa offered us water from a goatskin pouch. And the inside of the pouch was covered with tuya wood tar from the Reef Mountains giving water an indescribable freshness. The most anticipated adventure of the summer was the harvesting and distillation of pennyroyal mint in the fields, used to man manufacture menthol. My father had a business extracting aromatic plants, oils, with distillation points dispersed all around Morocco. And we traveled by jeep into the countryside to visit them. In overwhelming heat, the odors of eucalyptus, spearmint, rosemary, thyme, verbena, myrtle, laurel, and fennel would accompany the deafening sounds of the cicadas. My father would come home in the evening with his hands impregnated with the essence of pennyroyal mint and yellowed by his cigarettes, 
Cravena, a British brand of blonde tobacco. And to me, this combination is more evocative of him than his real portrait. All these scents and the memories associated with them are part of my olfactory re repertoire. But how can I transmit them to my American-born children? How to communicate to friends, loved ones, or new generations what I have felt in my innermost self? Are these sensations not isolating us if they cannot be shared? The sense and taste of my childhood are a powerful source of inspiration for me, generating themes that echo in my creations. My work as a perfumer enables me to recreate those memories inextricably linked to my past and to pour these drops of memory into perfume bottles. I can deliver an experience that connects to, con to customers in the here and now and in the process transform the intimate into the universal. Having said a, a bit about memory, let me turn now to the creative process. Beginning with how an original idea is born, moving to how it is developed and elaborated to generate a fragrance. Inspiration begins with a gut process that seems to emerge from the realm of daydream of fantasy. However, this raw material must be filtered through critical thinking to transform my whimsical notion into a formula. I have found that my continual mental dialogue with nature to be a rich source of inspiration. For example, the scent of orange flower, and that will be your second blotter coming around, the scent of orange flower takes me right back to Tangiers in my native Morocco. I remember walking through the groves of orange trees and smelling the orange flower water that filled the air when people celebrated in the streets. I remember savoring the candied orange flower petals we call letuario. It is a scent that I will forever associate with my experiences, thoughts, and feelings an olfactory invocation of an atmosphere. Another aspect of inspiration comes from attraction and sensuality. The reality is that flowers alone cannot convey the full range of emotions, emotions and desires. And that's why perfumers turn to other notes, such as wood, ambers, and musks, to give flesh to our ideas. Nor is the creative process the exclusive province of daydreams. <clears throat> Science plays a significant role. Our researchers continuously generate new aromatic ingredients, which in turn trigger novel responses in the perfumer. For example, 30 years ago, a powerful green note, aldehyde A, was created in our labs and the way it interacted with patchouli oil fascinated me. And that inspiration, part science and part art, led me to design a fragrance known as Polo by Ralph Lauren. So once inspiration has been found, how does creation begin? The first step is to allow the mind to play freely. I daydream often straying into an irrational mental realm Eventually, an olfactory image emerges in my mind. And Picasso said, d'abord je trouve, puis je cherche. First I find, then I seek. And this describes the working backwards to find the unique blend of ingredients to express my idea. As my thoughts wander, new accords emerge by association and reaching the original theme. And Emile Zola once said, the artist is nothing without the gift, but the gift is nothing without the work. When I create a fragrance, my concern is not only the character or theme of the accord, my construction is guided by attention to several structural concepts. The majority of the fragrance is the base, composed of the less volatile, more long-lasting big blocks. 
The rest of it, the top note, includes lighter, more volatile ingredients. The proportion among the ingredients is essential. The trail, which refers to the volume of space perfumed around the wearer, is constantly considered. We borrow the vocabulary of other senses to better describe the olfactory experience. For example, we speak of light and dark, transparent and opaque, loud and quiet perfumes. At every stage, the perfumer critiques and evaluates the fragrance in progress. The fragrance is weighed and studied on blotters and skin and subjected to thousands of hair splitting experimental variations. Even one part per million can significantly alter the final product. And that's where art and science meet. Each chemical element has its own character, affinities, and antagonism. And no amount of artistry can replace the deep understanding of each ingredient involved. And dissecting these facets in the creative process, I hope I haven't given you the impression that they operate in a predictable sequence. In fact, it's the constant iterative interplay of scent, memory, personalities, intuition, scientific data, and consumer understanding that result in the transformation of a creative idea into an innovative fragrance. Having spoken about scent, memory, and creativity, I would turn now to the element of new technology and devote the rest of my talk to new frontiers in our field. First, let's look briefly at the living flower head space technology. Living flower technology is a research method created by Dr. Braja Mukherjee at International Flavors and Fragrances, where I work, more than 20 years ago. It allows us to study the scent of living flowers while still in the plant. To identify its key ingredients, a globe is placed around the object of study, usually a flower, to concentrate the molecules around it. A microextraction needle coated with a wax that binds to the molecules in the air is introduced into the globe. After a few hours of collection, we then inject the needle into a gas chromatograph, which connected to a mass spectrometer separates and identify the components. The work is very painstaking. Each analysis yields more than 100 ingredients, and you have to decipher which ones contribute the most. With this in hand, you can attempt to reproduce the smell, and the process can take several months, but it's a sign of things to come a particular twist on je trouve puis je cherche. In this case, we started with a found object and searched for the formula. And well done, it can unlock not just scientific knowledge, but creative possibilities. The second frontier that I've explored personally is the interplay between fragrance and painting. The antique Chinese ancestor portraits that hang in my home have always intrigued me. So I decided to create my own ancestor gallery, integrating photography, painting, technology, and fragrance to create a multisensory representation that captured my olfactive memory of the ancestor. I've told you about my vivid memory of my father coming home from his distillation field smelling of penny royal mint and tobacco. I searched far and wide for his Cravenet cigarettes to remember the aroma. No longer sold in England, a kind friend eventually found them for me in Turkey. But reproducing the scent of tobacco, of tobacco leaves, with more than 400 components identified, required more than just science. I think you can smell the third blotter Living headspace technology allowed me to identify some of the key ingredients to which I added pennyroyal mint essential oil produced by IFF in Spain. And the result vividly evokes my father aura. 
Now my own ancestor paintings hang in my home, and if you gently rub the paint, you unlock the embedded scent evoking the spirit of the long gone relative. And for me, it's part of using art to connect the personal with universal. Where I came from, from where I live now, the past and present with the future. And let me now, <clears throat> finally, turn to the mix of scent, memory, and technology that is the Morgan Library, Library Project. In 2016, <clears throat> My friend Jorge Otero Palios, professor and director of historic preservation here at Colombia, and Christine Nelson, the Drew Hines curator of literary and historical manuscripts at the Morgan Library, invited me to partner with them on a project. Our mission was to collect the smells of objects, spaces, and old books in Pierpont Morgan's library and to study their composition scientifically using the living headspace technology. Our team, including Suba Patel and Penelope Bigelow, was to collect and analyze the sense of the Morgan. And I thank each of them for this fascinating challenge and opportunity and for their hard work. Why the Morgan? I quote, I quote here Jorge. People in my field are interested in what makes big buildings significant. And in fact, people's memories are what makes building culturally significant. And smell is the most direct way to those memories, and we pay so little attention to it. Also, this building is one of the places where the shape of the American economy was decided. During the financial panic of 1907, Morgan locked a group of bankers in his study until they came to an agreement to save the American economy. The Morgan Library and the West Room had never seen anything like our project. At times, it resembled a scene out of Law and Order or CSI, <laughs> with people sniffing hidden staircases, old cabinets, 500-year-old books in the vault. We were also given an old cigar box containing Pedro Muria's Cuban cigars that had been used by Pierpont Morgan himself. Here is Jorge enjoying it. And I must confess that they still smell pretty good a century later. Our second visit was with Jorge's preservation class to continue our study and have the students reconstruct the 1907 scent of the Morgan. Now the results of our study. In the headspace of the famous book, and it's hard to pronounce, in Jesus, the flower of the commandments of God printed by Wiccan with the word in 1521, Clint Wormers, the IFF analyst, identified 86 volatile components. In the leather book binding of the Golden Legend, also 1521, volatile ingredients were, 75 volatile ingredients were identified. 102 components were found in Pierpont Morgan Pedro Muria's Cuban cigar box. And in the bookshelves analysis, 66 ingredients were identified. We used the headspace technology described above. And once the identification had taken place, the reconstitution was a lengthy, complex endeavor. Many of these ingredients were not in the perfumer's palette. And some had never been synthesize at all. We then decided uh, to which one were the most salient ingredients and start harmonizing them. And because we had so many unfamiliar molecules, the technique that was so successful with living flowers proved its limits in reproducing the smell of the objects of the library. Working in conjunction with my trainee perfumer, Andrew Everett, right here helping me, we decided to recreate a fantasy scent of the 1907 scene when all the panicked bankers were locked in the West Room. <laughs> we used our imagination, 
the scent of old wooden furniture, the headspace of the open page, the cigar box, the leather binding, as well as a whiff of a men's cologne popular in the turn of the century. But last but not least, the smell of fear. Technology can only, and that's what I would like you to smell. I think it's the fourth, a blotter. Thank you. Technology can only capture a facet of reality. Other facets reside in our sensory perceptions and memories. But it is only when you unleash the emotional component that you can get closer to evoking the past. The artistic interpretation of the painter, writer, poet, filmmaker, architect, or perfumer are essential to reinvent the past. And that's why at this intersection of scent, memory, art, and technology, I believe that personal creativity can never be replaced as a vital ingredient. Because these elements are linked together, past and present, scientific and imaginative, chemical and subjective, beauty and even memory will always be in the nose of the beholder. This room has never smelled better. It's really like, could we just hold that? Um, our next speaker is Emily Spratt, a Byzantine and Renaissance Baroque art historian, cultural heritage specialist, and strategic advisor in the art tech sector. She's currently finishing her doctorate in the Department of Art and Archaeology at Princeton University on the legacy, legacy of Byzantium in the early modern period and recently completed a fellowship at the Frick Collection Art Reference, uh, where she consults and conducts research on computer vision technology. Emily also advises startup companies that employ machine learning techniques for the analysis of visual media and was strategic advisor for Artory, uh, which she helped pivot into an art market and blockchain-based business with a background in cultural heritage management, having worked for the Hellenic Ministry of Culture and Museums in Greece, Emily has taught in the Department of Art History in the Program in Heritage and Preservation Studies at Rutgers University, and has been a member of the Art and AI Lab at the Department of Computer Science. In 2017, Emily curated a pioneering exhibition, Unhuman, Art in the Age of AI, which showcased the art produced by the ICANN algorithm in LA, Frankfurt, and was featured on CBS News. Last year, Emily organized with her colleagues at the Frick, Sympo the Frick Symposium, Searching Through Seeing, Optimizing Vision Technology for the Arts, and was the honorary guest editor for the special magazine issue on computers and art for the Association of Computing Machinery. And uh, her work is really um, at the forefront of this idea that Artificial intelligence can help us rethink what heritage is, and not just in, the, in processing the data, which is very important, but I think one of her uh, important contributions is in helping us figure out how to actually understand it ourselves, how, we, how it gets played back to us. So, please join me in welcoming Emily Spratt. Well, it is my honor to be here today um, as a part of this very compelling colloquium. Thank you very much to all the organizers of the event. In his 1995 essay, Archive Fever or Mal d'Archive, Jacques Derrida critiqued the role of technology in the construction of the information archive, largely as a response to the birth of mainstream email culture and the alarming potential of this digital record-keeping system. According to Derrida, the archive was a pledge to the future of society, as archival technology anticipated and fostered its very development. Although the essay was written before Hotmail, Yahoo Mail, and Gmail were even launched, Almost a quarter century later, we exchange roughly 260 billion emails a day, and the growth of data is outpacing the development of the computing technologies that can manage it. This was anticipated, although not quite on this scale. 
Today, the size of the data universe more than doubles every two years, and machine-produced data is increasing at 50 times the growth rate of traditional businesses. The data explosion is so significant that ind industries of every variety are reshaping themselves to incorporate data collection and analytics into their practices, and data scientists are widely sought to manage previously unimaginable collections with the tools of artificial intelligence. Big data has become the ultimate archive. But the records are so vast and challenging to interpret that the defining question of our time has become one of curatorship. How do we curate this growing repository of digital information and what tools are needed to do this? In this presentation, I will discuss one component of this repository, the visual data related to art and cultural heritage. By examining some approaches to the ways that digital image and video collections are being managed, I will suggest that the ontological function of image archives in our society are undergoing a radical transformation. Yet, eight foreseeable trends may be observed as new types of engagement with visual data are being explored largely experimentally. This metamorphosis is indicative of not only the visual landscape of our future digital world, but also the structures of power inherent in the custodianship of the interpretations of these new collections. Furthermore, it is important to underscore that the management of visual data is increasingly being developed outside the parameters of the traditional archives location in a museum, university, or library. As physical archives are increasingly being digitized and made publicly available, the commercial world is quickly building the infrastructure to manage this information, and this is not without political consequence. Indeed, as Derrida stressed, the concept of the archive is, at its etymological root, inextricably tied to the notion of legal authority and the archons who delegate the law through the power of records. Derivative of the ancient Greek word archaeon, the term archive refers to both a commencement and a commandment of the law. And as is the case with all directives, there is an element of hubris in this assumption of authority. For example, a recently released Vodafone commercial demonstrates the confidence we have in the speed of our connectivity, data streaming, and vision technology to stand in for human sight itself. Here, a stuntman on a motorcycle is blindfolded by the Vodafone team so that he is entirely reliant upon the machine eyes of his mobile device to navigate a treacherous path. He manages unflinchingly and impresses us with his expert handling of the bike. We are left somewhat assured of the power of machine eyes to stand in for our own visual experiences of an event. For Derrida, however, this would be considered an unnecessary concession to the machine and a harbinger of shifting societal expectations of technology. Today, a very different type of computer vision than the one illustrated by the Vodafone commercial is influencing our interactions with digital media. This is a subset of AI called machine learning, which emphasizes deep learning by using algorithms and statistical models to perform a specific task through the computer's examination of patterns and inference-based observations of data without relying on explicit instructions on how the task should be accomplished. What is remarkable about this burgeoning field is that the forefront of research is happening through the example the example of images, and the concept of visual analysis in our digital world comes down to what I coin the machine-learned image. Let me clarify. The archive preserves artifacts which constitute a collection, and these artifacts are digitized to represent the physical archive. Yet not only do these digital images take on a secondary role as artifacts in and of themselves, they have become data points amenable to machine analysis. 
These concepts come to life in the art installation by Rafik Anadol from 2017. Once the digital images of artifacts are analyzed with machine learning, this data becomes a part of a new interpretive constellation, one that is not fully knowable, yet posits all the structural elements of the singular image to be indicative of its relationship with other images it has encountered, other machine learned images. My first observation of the future of the archive is therefore not only the potential of machine learning techniques to reveal new relationships amongst its constituent parts, relationships that are dependent on other machine learned images, but a growing emphasis on the relationships of data over the focus on a singular digital artifact. Indeed, my second anticipation of the future of art and AI is the trend toward valuing the entire repository of visual information over the singular digital record. The whole, therefore, becomes more significant than the parts, and the collection gains significance not for its masterpieces, but for its potential as an interactive, interrelational totality. By extension, the availability of a given data set becomes essential, and in a world where fully digitized and publicly available collections are the exception, not the rule. How this area of research takes shape will depend on which cultural institutions make their archives digitally accessible. This installation, Archive Dreaming, was commissioned by the SALT Research Center in Istanbul to bring attention to its image-rich collection of digitized modern documents pertaining to Turkey and the southeastern Mediterranean world. Using machine learning techniques, Anadol and his collaborators analyzed 1,700,000 records to produce this user-driven, immersive media installation that took place in San Francisco and Istanbul. Another exhibition currently in formulation for the Williams College, of, uh, Williams College Museum of Art by Studio the Green Isle employs data from the Metropolitan Museum of Art's open access initiative to display entire digital collections of art with a similar encyclopedic approach to visual engagement with object records as we saw in the previous example. Aptly titled, All at Once, the exhibition space is transformed into a digitally rendered kind of Kunstkama, or cabinet of curiosities, a place where man's mastery of the world is articulated in his expansive collection of artifacts. In the early modern period, the Kunstkama was a place of discovery and learning through the direct experience of objects that represented various worldly phenomena. This was a place reserved for those privileged enough to gain access to it. Today, digital cabinets of curiosity are reserved for the tech-enabled and allow for new means of discovery which favor sight over touch. As viewers, we can enjoy the visual panoply of, entire, of an entire collection in a single viewing. Yet this form of engagement is not without consequence and brings us to the third and fourth anticipations of the future archive. The default position of machine learned images is their treatment as equal parts of the totality they represent. Unless explicitly weighted by a programmer to be interpreted differently, individual rec digital records undergo something of a democratizing effect. Simultaneously, there is a dramatic reformulation of scale that catalyzes our expectation that every digital artifact be seen as the same size without regard to the physical parameters of the object itself. This particular image group of late Byzantine icons derived from my own research photos and scans, and while they appear here all roughly the same size, not only are their digital formats different, the actual objects they represent vary from the size of one's fist to the dimensions of your average old master's portrait. Not only does size matter in our interpretation of an artifact, 
it is dangerous to assume that all digital records have equal values, as this could lend to the creation of a narrative about the machine-learned image which may be divorced from the historical truth of the object it represents. It is therefore essential that these constructions of visual engagements with archives and collections are built hand-in-hand -hand with scholars from the humanities. At the Frick Collection and Art Reference Library, one collaboration project we are pursuing with researchers in computer science and, en and engineering at Stanford and Cornell includes using transfer learning to automatically label the 1.2 million images in the museum's photo archive. Essentially, this means applying pre-trained image classification algorithms to examine the visual content of the collection, thus creating a rudimentary iconographic index of the photographs with better efficiency than only relying on the data set from the collection as a source from which the computer makes an analysis of the images. This project, and a number of other recently built visual search tools, will greatly aid archivists from having to label digital images by hand and support the creation of a strong foundational data from which to build even more useful machine learning based analyses of visual data. The formation of FAROS, the International Consortium of European and North American Art Historical Photo Archives, which has a research commitment to make their collections digitally available and amenable to the latest digital tools for curation, is a promising sign of the direction that cultural institutions are moving. A basic image recognition tool specifically designed for Italian Renaissance art has already been developed by John Rasig for the consortium. In the same vein, the Metropolitan Museum of Art has recently created collaborations with Microsoft, MIT, and Wikimedia through the results of a recent hackathon to increase viewer engagement with the collection. Given that the future museum will likely become more dependent on its reported number of viewers clicking on its digital collection than its number of visitors to its physical collections, the emerging curatorial potential of digital holdings will no longer be sidelined. Like the initiative to correctly label images in photo archives, the Met is collaborating with Wikimedia on a project that uses machine learning to automatically tag features in a work of art. Once these labels are generated for a given artwork, they are then made publicly available to allow for the verification of that label with human supervision. Here is my contribution verifying that a mountain appears in the painting of Lago Maggiore. Only inaugurated on January 31st, this project has great future potential to enhance the quality of online visual searches of art and is creating a future training data set more suitable to the image recognition requirements of digital images of art than the generic go-to data sets that are usually employed. These examples demonstrate the fifth anticipation of the future archive, which is that foundations are being built with machine learned images to allow for new forms of discovery that privilege visual engagement and foster visual curiosity. In the next examples that I will provide, I'd like to highlight another AI technique that is transforming our conception of the archive. This is the use of GANs, or generative adversarial networks, which are essentially two deep neural network architectures composed of a generator and a discriminator to selectively create new content, once having been trained on a given data set. An MIT-based project called Gen Studio, led by Sarah Schwetman, utilizes the Met's digital images to map the relationships of visually similar objects. With the use of GANs, an image representing the visual relationship between the mapped objects at a given point is produced. In this example, I chose the category goblet and picked a point in the upper register of the map. On the left side, you see the image of a GAN-produced goblet that the computer has created to represent its formulation of similarity to the other goblets in its proximity. To be clear, the goblet on the left does not physically exist. 
but is what the computer visually comes up with as a goblet in its relative comparison to the other real goblets. Outside of the interesting questions that this project raises about formalism, what I find most remarkable about the use of GANs in the art and cultural heritage sectors is that digital collections of objects that do not actually physically exist, nor were created by human hands, can be produced nearly ad infinitum. In the case of the goblets, this could be useful in creating a training set of images to enable an algorithm to better identify unlabeled digital images of goblets. Indeed, one of the biggest barriers to using AI techniques on digital image collections of art is that the data sets are too small. Employing GANs to produce more training examples of visually similar objects could allow for the creation of increasingly effective machine-learned images. What the consequences of this will be on the hermeneutics of the collection, however, remain unknown. At this point in time, we can simply make the sixth observation that attention to the formal qualities of art is resurgent and that the processes inherent in vision tech applications are influencing this movement. While these modes of interaction with visual data are still largely experimental, they have great potential to disrupt our notion of traditional image collections, especially when the computer-generated image is not easily discernible from the digital image of the actual physical thing represented. A research group at Berkeley recently addressed ways to enhance the performance of generative models. In one trial, they trained their algorithm on a data set containing the headshots of celebrities and were able to produce these results. While a close examination of these images does indeed reveal that they are not real photographs of actual people, it is alarming how convincing these machine-generated celebrities actually are. Although not intended to be viewed as an art collection, they are just figure 10 in a computer science paper. These results are outstanding. It follows that our seventh anticipation of the future archive concerns the ethical questions raised by our ability to make a new face, a new record, a new object, a new artwork, a new archive, or a new collection, which are only indirectly related to that which exists in the physical world of things. What will constitute the authenticity of a given record is therefore a subject that I expect will come to define this age both philosophically and legally. Already, much distrust is brewing in this domain. Nonetheless, both the potential creative and security-related uses of machine-generated material are transforming our notion of the archive. In a 2016 NIPS paper first authored by Carl Vondrick, who is now here at Columbia, the ability to produce machine-generated videos based on the predictive outcomes of scenes was demonstrated. In this generation of beach scenes, the machine anticipates the movement of the beach walkers and the crashing surf of the waves. And in this slide, you see the predicted movement of trains. I see these outputs as art in and of itself, but in this type of research that will be used to verify that the videos in our historic archives are authentic, that the news you are watching has not been tampered with, and that our videos have no gaps. In Maldarkiv, Derrida saw the managers of the archive as bearing the responsibility for not only the physical security of the collection, but, quote, holding the hermeneutic right and competence of them. The archivists are thus the ones who have the power to interpret the archive, and their contents have the power to speak the law, end quote. In the age of AI, we must ask, what, what rights are we willing to give the machine to interpret our digital records? Once we outsource the act of interpretation, we also concede part of our custodial powers over the ideas the archive was intended to represent. 
This in turn affects the discursive history of the archive, which becomes a part of a new system of knowledge production. I am not at all suggesting that we cease developing computer vision technology for reasons of trepidation, no. The issue is that the notion of a strict binary between what constitutes human and machine-based analysis is in fact becoming increasingly gray, and with this come socio-political consequences. For this reason, my final anticipation of the future archive is something of a warning of the misleading, anthropomorphizing descriptions we give to the machine. We are quick to describe deep learning processes as dreams, hallucinations, and even memories, but by doing so, we imply that the machine has a psyche which is fueled by unconscious desires. It is now more imperative than ever that we disambiguate our terms and clearly explain what our algorithms purport to perform. In conclusion, I am privileged to be allowed to share a video of an installation by Mario Klingemann that goes to auction in London next month for Sotheby's Contemporary Art Sale. On two screens, Gann produced images trained on a select data set of portraits from the 17th to 19th centuries are projected according to their gender. Rather than emphasizing the production of a singular image, the data encrypted algorithms ceaselessly generate new faces, never allowing the viewer possession of any one portrait. Indeed, what you see projected in this video has an almost impossible mathematical probability of being generated again. This portrait machine of perpetual creation, contained in but one artwork, yet also uncontainable in its act of constant disappearance, masterfully demonstrates the aesthetic frontier of the machine-learned and generated image. The archive fever is blistering and even elusive in our age of AI, but the blinded stuntman landed Thank flawlessly. Thank you very much. Uh, our, our final speaker is um, Carlos Bayod. Um, Carlos is, is um, uh, director at the Factum Foundation uh, and is, our, is, is a professor here. And Carlos's arrival at Columbia together with um, his, his uh, uh, colleague, Adam Lowe, was really transformative for, for the program because they brought an expertise in digital scanning and replication that helped us to really advance that area within, within the program. And they've continued to, to replay uh, data with, uh, and to help our students understand just how difficult it is, just how difficult it is to do what you know, we see and appear so, to be so simple. So if anything, Carlos has really been able to unpack the complexity of it all. I think we're so used to in these days of sort of YouTube how-to videos where we just sit there and watch experts doing expert things and everything seems so easy. Um, it's so refreshing to actually do the work, something that Carlos was pointing to. And, and uh, Carlos Benaim, but Car uh, Carlos Bayod has really taken the students through the, the, the process and he has done this also uh, by, by pushing his, the technology within Factum Foundation. So he's been spearheading both new scanners, new ways of scanning heritage, new ways of replicating heritage with some really extraordinary projects like the replica of Tutankhamun's tomb and the replica of Seti I's uh, tomb. These are some really extraordinary uh, projects that have begun to really bring the, these, these technologies to a, to a broader public. And so here he's been really investigating the, 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 the nano or the submillimetric, not nano, but submillimetric uh, capacity of, of these technologies with our students. And some of whom have then gone on to create their own companies like Andre and Haley, a shout out to them back there in, in, in the back. 
So it's the beginning of, a, of a, an incredible transformation that we're going back to the first slide of the day of the Preservation Technology Lab that Carlos has been a big part of. So please join me in welcoming Carlos Bayer. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Jorge, for the introduction. Thank you, all the team organizing the Fitch Colloquium. And I'd also like to say thank you, Norman, for his keynote speech yesterday, very inspiring. Um, I would like to talk about what can we learn out of the surface of things in the context of preservation, and especially why is it important to uh, develop new tools and new um, methodologies for capturing surface of things. So what we do, in fact, in foundation is uh, developing new technologies, digital technologies, for visualizing and measuring um, the cultural heritage. So one of our probably most famous projects is what Jorge was mentioning, facsimile of Tutankhamun. There was, this is one of the headlines of the news covering the installation of the facsimile near the original tomb in the Valley of the Kings. So this was a very important, it was a very famous project, but we are now embarked into something much bigger, something probably more, even more important than this, is the tomb of Seti I. For the last years, we have been recording every um, square meter of the reliefs of the walls in this uh, pharaonic tomb, and we have been trying to apply different technologies in combination with uh, uh, color recording, um, photogrammetry, of course, laser scanning, in order to try to capture the current conservation state of the monument. Because the thing with uh, this site is that for many decades, it has been closed to the public for preservation. So the idea is, can we at once document the current state of this site and also eventually produce a facsimile that can bring, again, people to see this fantastic space? Um, we have been using different technologies, as I say. Uh, it's been a uh, work in progress for the last months, for the last years, because the goal is not only to capture the shape or, let's say, the architectural space of the different rooms, but also focusing on the very detail of the walls, of this amazing relief on the walls, that it's also possible to be captured with, when you are working with high resolution capturing technology. We are, of course, talking about non-contact recording. We are not using invasive technology. So what we are doing is recording the shape of the walls, but also the minute details that makes this particular area of the wall unique. The scratches on the walls, uh, the different damages that have happened to the uh, wall over the years. So all this is thanks to high resolution recording. So one very brief note about high resolution because resolution can mean different things depending on the application you are looking for. This is the same object reproduced um, after being recorded with two different systems, when we are talking about long-range scanning, it is perfect for analyzing the facade of a building or a landscape. But when we are aiming to produce a facsimile, a digital replica that will have a physical component, we really need to be able to capture what is unique, for example, in this particular brick wall. Not just a standard brick, but what is unique about this one in particular. So that's why when we talk about high resolution, we are talking about uh, 100 microns resolution. We are aiming about a higher amount of points of information than can give us a closest, closer correspondence to reality. And this is not a very scientific concept, how close to reality. And I would say we are still looking, about, uh, looking to respond to this question, but it's about recording things in a way that we can keep learning more about it when we look at the reproduction. This is the reproduction of, of a room of Seti I. We managed to complete a series of rooms and then create a temporary installation in the Antiquian Museum in Basel in Switzerland, reproducing some of the main chambers, like the Hall of Beauties or the main funerary chamber. So this is the combination of all the different recording technologies, panoramic color, photography, laser scanning, also combined with traditional craft skills. There is always this combination in our workshop between digital technologies and traditional crafts. This facsimile, this uh, real-size replica, 
was for a few months in Basel, but the intention is that it will be installed in the Valley of the Kings, near the original, eventually, I hope sooner than later. And this will be our answer to this idea of sustainable tourism. We believe that through facsimiles, it will be possible to effectively, it is actually possible to separate the act of preserving a monument from the act of visiting the monument. And that can be a different in places like this. So, a work like this, it's challenging because it's a huge uh, project, but then the real challenge for us is what happens when we want to record the three dimensions of paintings. So these are the most complex, most difficult uh, objects for us. So as you can see, when you are looking, when you are capable of seeing the surface of a painting is because it's not properly lit. So the illumination is not correct. But at the same time, you need this combination of color and relief to understand the character and the uniqueness of a work of art. This is why we developed our own tools, the Lucida 3D scanner, for example, is a laser scanner specifically developed for capturing the surface of paintings and other low relief objects. And this is what we've been doing. So when we are, for example, recording a painting by Rubens, a panel painting like this one in the Museo del Prado, we are capturing the color with a different system, let's say with panoramic color photography, but then we want the 3D scanner to, to ignore the color and we want the 3D scanner to focus on capturing the relief of the object, okay? So we are suddenly in front of something that is not just a flat image. So suddenly a painting is not a bi-dimensional image. It's something that is more close to a landscape, to a topography. It reveals its true um, character as an object. It's like if, if we were removing the layer of color out of a painting, the destruction of the color virtually, of course, and then we can zoom in because we are talking about very fine detail resolution and we can understand things like the thickness of the brush strokes, we can read and measure the uh, cracks on the wood, in this case it's a panel painting. There are so many things, especially if you are a conservator or an expert, not exactly like me in this case, you can try to look for th certain elements on the painting that can give you a lot of information about the trajectory, about the biography of this particular object. So we have been recording over 180 paintings um, since we created this particular scanner. And for example, for panel paintings, it is essential to record something before and after restoration as a way of monitoring how the object has been changing uh, with a process of cleaning or consolidating the panel or simply just for monitoring change over time in works of art. This is possible thanks to this type of 3D scanning. When we are talking about canvases, of course we have been recording uh, paintings that are abstract paintings in which there is already a consciousness about the texture. So sometimes the texture is very evident. The three dimension quality of the painting is more evident. But in other cases, like in the Black Square by Mal Malevich, the texture is much more subtle. We are talking about appreciating, and I learned to appreciate over time, these very subtle qualities of supposedly flat objects like this type of paintings. This information, what I'm showing on screens, is basically renders, it's simulation of the relief. We are, this is not just like a raking light photography. We are actually capturing a 3D model that then we can reproduce. But essentially, this type of information is something you can combine with other layers of data, which they have been doing in museums for a long time, like X-ray analysis, infrared, ultraviolet, etc. You can combine all these layers together with this one, with the relief, which is not uh, like seen through the painting, is effectively the opposite. It's like a top layer that can add another uh, set of new information for those in charge of taking care of the object or just for the public. We have been, of course, using this system for recording wall paintings, frescoes, and in these cases, the topography, what they call the, um, the low frequency relief, is more evident. It's something that um, when we are talking about reproducing these type of objects, it's in a way easier because there is already a, a high topography uh, that we can reproduce, for example, when we are recording a medieval map, like in this case, that already has a lot of wrinkles and bumps. So when we want to reproduce objects like this, we normally re um, use CNC milling machines, like subtractive technology, 
for fabricating something like this and then maybe reproducing it as a plaster reproduction. So it can be converted into a tactile object, something that used to be a very fragile thing. It can be something people can touch. Uh, but then what happens when we are interested in objects that are much more uh, flat, like for example drawings or a cartoon in which the, high, uh, the low frequency relief is very shallow, very flat, but we are interested in very uh, detailed uh, characteristics on the surface like punching marks or small foldings. So it is essential to use just a different type of technology. We, are, we have been working in a very innovative process with OCE, a Canon company, that they have developed this type of uh, effectively like 3D printing with layers of ink, okay? It's like stacking layers of ink. And for the first time, it is giving us even more resolution in the reproduction side that we can actually record. So with, with milling, with routing, it's kind of the opposite. We always have more information on screen or in our digital files that we could reproduce. But with this type of, I would say, revolutionary 3D printing technology, which is possible to combine relief and color at the same time, we are actually a bit behind of what is possible to reproduce. So then we will have to keep updating our uh, recording methodologies. Then how you apply the color, right? That's for another lecture, not for today. But of course, there's, uh, it, it would require another field of expertise, how you combine the layer of color with a layer of relief. At the end, we are in a, an architecture school, and I am myself an architect, so we have been always wondering how to apply this type of super highly detailed recordings to the world of architecture, or more specifically, to the preservation of architecture. So this is what we have been working thanks to this collaboration between the Factum Foundation and the Historic Preservation Program here in Colombia. And we have been trying to answer the question of how to apply uh, close-range recording to architecture, or I would say even better, to how to try to ask the correct questions. And in the last years, with this uh, studio, I will show you some examples of how we have been trying to address this issue. The collaboration of the Factum Foundation with the program consists basically on providing access to projects and sites and buildings in which the surface is essential to understand their complex history. And we are also helping with ex providing expertise and equipment in order to record them. So for example, in the case of the Church of San Baudelio in Spain, it's a monument that actually exists in fragments because the wall paintings were removed near 100 years ago, and they are now scattered in different museums throughout the world. So we were trying to apply these different recording technologies, photogrammetry, uh, laser scanning, to document the structure of the building in Spain and also the paintings in the museums, for example, in this case here in New York, in the Cloisters Museum, the Metropolitan Museum, as a way to try to bring back together these two elements, the structure of the building that now looks like completely um, empty in Spain with the actual information that is contained in the wall paintings. So we have to do that, of course, not physically. It is not possible to reintegrate those frescoes back in the church, but it is possible to try, once you have the information in high resolution, you can try different digital methodologies to try to uh, provide a more complete experience when understanding and when reading this monument. This project, for example, has been continued by Hayley Ramos and Andre Jauregui by trying to propose an approach based on mixed reality, specifically with augmented reality, to facilitate uh, to those visiting the church the experience of seeing uh, the paintings that were recorded in museums as a way to provide a more authentic experience. So in a way, originality and authenticity, it's also a complex relationship, and their project is uh, exactly trying to give an answer to this. We work a lot in Italy, especially in Venice, and it's obviously, as Frederick explained, there's so much you can read out of the um, architectural history in Venice. We were recording the trophy wall in St. Mark's Square, also in, in 
as part of this uh, preservation technology studio. And this is not with the aim of making facsimiles. In this case, it's more as a documentation project in order to understand the large scale of architecture through analyzing, through trying to reading and visualize the close um, scale of details of the material. We are talking here about stones from different origins, different types of marble. And we will be working more and more in Venice, as uh, also was mentioned before, this new initiative called Archive, Analysis and Recording of Cultural Heritage in Venice, in collaboration with Fondazione Cini and Digital Humanities Lab. We will be trying to close the circle. So in a way, we are putting technology for recording things, and then with the Digital Humanities Lab, it will be about interpreting this data and extracting knowledge out of that. One last example I want to share with you is what we have been doing just a few months ago in Seville, in Spain, in Casa de Pilatos. So this is a very special building. It's a Renaissance palace that contains a very unique uh, collection of 16th century tiles. And they are in, generally, in general more or less well preserved, but the tiles are suffering the effects of the, just the, the time passing in the structural stability of the building. So the different cracks that can be discovered in the tiles and the way some of them have to be replaced. So it's a silent but uh, progressive decay of this specific um, part of this building. So we were recording in a very intensive week with the students just last semester in an extraordinary teamwork that we were able to capture uh, almost a third of, of the more than 120 different designs of tile um, uh, examples that were across the building. The idea of a project like this is, as with other examples, what can you learn about the building as a whole by analyzing specifically in the submillimeter scale and then how can you bridge this gap between the large scale of architecture and the small scale of analyzing um, art elements like these ones. So this is basically attempts of trying to close this gap between scale. And I, I'm sure that thanks to conversation with all of you, with the faculty here, with students, we are trying to envision new uses for this type of technology that we cannot even see right now. So at the end, beyond of replicas, beyond the use of making facsimiles, the importance is how to transmit this information to the future generations, how you can use as much as possible the available technology for recording the current state of things before they change, before they decay even more. And of course, just to remark that the technology is there. So we have seen it today with all the presentations, and the technology is there to be used. So thank you. I wish we had um, not not the whole evening, but the whole, like another year to, for us to, to to discuss this. In the spirit of the um, of the day and the notion of experimentation, I am going to try to experiment with the format of uh, the panel. So I am not going to necessarily ask you a question about your own. Um, about your own talk, but I'm going to try to pull things from each of your talks and ask other people, like each of you, to reflect on each other's talk. Um, and so I thought that um, uh, I would begin with um, with uh, taking a, an idea from Arnaud's talk and ask uh, Ian about it. And that is the notion of the avatar. When I was looking at our nose presentation, I kept thinking of the movie Avatar. And so yeah. I, 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 I pose, I, 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 I put the word avatar before you okay. and ask that's, you that's that. That's my prompt? And okay. think about so Minimalist, yes. minimalist prompt. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, I guess the thing I, I think of um, based on the, the minimalist prompt you've given me, is that it, it, it's, it's often as interesting to be somewhere else than to be someone else. And maybe it's even more interesting. Um, or differently put, when you are um, uh, placed uh, in reality or in virtuality in, a, in another environment, then you get to fill in 
all of these blanks about about wh what has taken place there or what might and and, and some of those can be uh, you know constrained by an understanding of history or a framing of a uh, of an experience um, so you know the this need that we that we feel and, and this is a fictional uh, example it turns out that that was not a real story avatar I hope I'm not breaking any right any, any, no, yeah. no spoiler um, alerts I think everyone uh, right. has seen them uh, no but, but you know it, it's it's Hollywood and so the you know the desire is to get you inside of another character's um, uh, experience and then that's literalized you know in this very the kind of cloyingly deliberate way in the in the figures. This is like this is an incredibly popular movie, right? Yes. Huge amounts of money. People are making more of them because people really liked uh, Avatar. So that's the there's that temptation about you know wanting to occupy another body. But in fact, um, I feel like in my heart that it's more interesting to occupy another space because then it's then it's your body in in that in that environment, right? Anyway, that's 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 my my thought based on your minimalist prompt. Well, we'll do a couple of minimalist prompts, and then we can have a, a, a larger mm -hmm. uh, conversation. Um, Emily, uh, I'm going to go super minimalist because now you now you push <laughs> yeah, me into the minimalist. Yes, um, right. Emily, empathy. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you. <laughs> um, okay. Um, a subject that also came out of your talk. Yeah. So we'll, 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 and, and also Carlos's, I think. Yeah. There's a lot of... I would say that um, one of the points I was trying to make in, in my presentation, sorry to dodge this a little bit and bring it back to what I'm working on, um, but is this idea of how collections are being reformulated and the attention away from the singular masterpiece to the idea of the whole, the totality, the repository at large. And I think that that, in a sense, desanitizes our understanding of, of art. And um, I, think, I think it's concerning. I think more attention needs to be brought to the nostalgic element that we have with the act of viewership, with aesthetic perception in and of itself. Um, a company I was recently reviewing actually has an investment model by uh, purchasing works of art, putting them in storage, and then having multiple people own a, a piece of it through the blockchain. Um, this to me is very sad. Um, we shouldn't have an aim of uh, art only as investment to be simply locked mm. away. I think. Uh, at the end of the day, there's something deeply uh, emotional, deeply engaging with a work of art, which acts as a sort of gateway in terms of our emotional response to something, a connection to a memory, uh, to something, and, and it's through that then that we can form that relationship. So I think right now um, it's fascinating that neuroscience in particular is really rediscovering all areas of perception and uh, certainly more work on things like mirror neurons could be helpful in uh, figuring out what's actually going on in the, the act of empathy, which is, is very complicated. And so if we can use uh, technology as a way to sort of explore this frontier a little bit more, um, I think that would be great. But I think, uh, I think cognitive scientists should be involved too. Um, Arno, I couldn't get minimalist enough, so I think I'm going to have to use a couple, a couple words. Thank God. Um, <laughs> I think from uh, Carlos's talk, mm. separating preservation from visitation or experience, direct experience. Yeah, I, I think that's a really interesting one. That kind of stuck me when you when you said it because um, I find that um, what we see as as um, a, 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 a connection or understanding. Um, a, a piece of art or, or a location, so if you were to say we're going to, to a temple or a tomb and the real one, and you make an association with that place because it is real and it is there and it has a history, as in the history of it is actually there. The history of the replica is just you creating it. That's his history, right? That's what the history of it is. It's, it was built, in a, it was built in, a, in, a, in a studio. That's the history and its history ends there as in its actual physical history. So then it kind of, how you feel about that when you go to different ones. And I think maybe, maybe, some, maybe there, there needs to be a way to, to, to 
still still make people feel that they're connected to that piece, even though they're walking into it, and the history is just is not there. I'm not saying the replica are not good enough. It's more just it will never be because it's still a replica, right? It's not possible for it to ever be what it is. I'm sure that's the bane of your life. When you're recreating things. It can never be the real one, even as much as we try to replicate things. And I do that day in and day out. I create digital versions of everything, but I never, I never feel that I, could, I will ever get to a point where I recreate something. And so there will always be two sides to it. There will always be two paths, and we'll never merge them. Well, I don't feel that. Can, since we're going experimental, can I just add Absolutely. one thing to that? Yeah, sure. um, so, by contrast, I would actually maybe almost even argue against that. Um, and the critical theorists um, had some ideas about the notion of the ontological possibilities of the replica. Mm -hmm. And uh, a really interesting essay by uh, Theodore Adorno uh, on the culture industry actually talked about the replication of music, jazz in particular, as um, both being terrifying in that it lost its meaning, but on the other hand, that certain replications of things could take on an enhanced meaning that would actually surpass the original thing. Hmm. And so there's something about why is it that in, in fashion, certain things come back in style? We don't need to get a pair of bell bottoms actually from the 70s. We want a pair that has been produced now because the design is getting it a little bit better, that somehow we're replicating hmm. that moment, the nostalgia for what that thing represents better than what it represented in its original creation. And so I think that y y you have a point, but on the other hand, there are other possibilities for the, the life of the, the digital replica. That's it. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I definitely agree with that, yeah. too. Yeah. Carlos, um, play. <laughs> well, we've gone back to the... Uh, <laughs> well, that's what we do every day, actually. <laughs> 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 that's our work. Uh, <laughs> We play with our minds, we play with our imagination, we play with, you know, that's how, uh, how we create, is through play. Um, I think that, you know, I, I saw a, a statistic that was so interesting, which was that when they did the uh, IQ of, uh, not the IQ, but uh, some kind of indication of the genius quality at three years old, you had the maximum possibilities of creativity, and then it goes downhill from there. Oh, yeah. so, <laughs> then there is sex until 18, and then, then it goes downhill from there as well. <laughs> so whatever we can recreate a little bit of that uh, immediacy and, and spontaneity is what we try to do every day. Since you've introduced a new variable into the into the experiment does anybody want to jump in i'd like to say that by seeing your presentation carlos's presentation it's if i had to propose some similarities to what we do is um, this obsession in the good sense of the word that trying to um, once you have this vision or this intuition then it's about looking for all the different ways of possible to try to replicate that feeling. For example, when you were mentioning that by um, trying to remember how to compose chemically a specific memory you had from childhood. So all this curiosity to try to dig down into what are the components of all that that is composing this memory and then trying to replicate that in the form of a uh, perfume, I found this I like to think it has something to do with what we do as well. So, can I can I ask you 